Hello, my fan friends. Welcome to another Rahala Stapa this week from Exeter with the amazing Professor Francesca Stavrakapulu. Uh, all about the Bible. You're going to love it. I promise you, it's great. Uh, she's fantastic. Uh, great, uh, exciting news uh, for coming up, Rahala Stapa. As you may have heard, uh, we're doing a run of five weeks in London, March the 9th. Uh, my guest will be Sir Michael Palin. Yes. At last, my dreams have all come true. Uh, imagine if I fuck it up and make him unhappy. How funny that will be. Um, I'm, I'm very much hoping I will not do that. It's all my dreams come true. Of course the tickets have sold out. Uh, and we're aiming for that kind of guest for every show. So it's worth booking ahead. Go to richchain.com slash gigs every Monday in March and April the 6th in London, March the 28th. In Birmingham, that one's selling very fast. It might even be sold out by the time you see this. Um, no guests announced for that yet. Norwich already sold out. There will be more dates added in the second half of the year. So why not come and see it live? RichardHerring.com slash gigs. Become a badger and you'll hear about the guests before everyone else. Uh, this Michael Palin gig sold out before it had been announced to the general non-badge scum populace. So go to GoFasterStripe.com slash badges. You get all kinds of other extras. I've told you about them a million times. Why don't you ever listen to me? Three pounds a month would really help us make loads more podcasts. So please go to gofasterstripe.com slash badges if you enjoy these podcasts. And if you can't afford to pay, don't pay. Uh, you could pay us back by recommending the, especially the audio podcast to other people. Um, every thousand or so people who listen to those gives us a, about 5p from the advertising. So come on. Let's do it, my fan friends. Help us out that way. Look, let's fuck off. Relax, sit back, and enjoy Raha Lustapur with Professor Francesca Stavrakapulu. I didn't even have to read it. I knew it off by heart. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Corn Exchange in Exeter. Please welcome a man who has come with some corn to exchange. Can't wait to find out what he's going to get for it. It's Richard Herring. Hello. Hello, Exeter. This is the furthest southwest I'm prepared to come. Fuck you, Plymouth. Um, yeah, fuck you. Unless you travelled up to see me here, that's nice of you. But and Cornwall can fuck off as well. So it's too far. So even this is too far away. Uh, it is lovely to be here. The corn exchange. The people. Are, this is the most modern corn exchange I've ever seen. This, this is usually an ancient thing. This corn exchange was built in 1983, by the looks of it. But look, oh, should we have a corn exchange next to see what? See, people can bring in corn exchange. It's like swap shop. Change it for. But other bits of corn, <laughs> similar bits of corn. <laughs> ah, but uh, welcome to Richard Herring's Languorous Sunday Torpor Podcast. Uh, you've got to come up with a new uh, thing every, every time you do this, come up with a new uh, angle now for podcasts. So I thought I would do a podcast three days after the last one in Winchester. I'm pretty tired. My son's had his second birthday party yesterday. I'm fucked. I've got no idea what's going on. <laughs> This is honestly like being on some kind of amazing drug. This, I might be talking to myself in a room, to be honest, at the moment. Uh, I'm quite tired, is what I'm saying, but it's going to be fine. Uh, I was talking to Gus Honeybun, though, the other day. Uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah. We're very much uh, in the catchment area for that. And um, he was doing some bunny hops with me. My friend Brian Buncroft uh, had uh, Gus Honeybun on his 11th birthday, a bit sad. Uh, and, and uh, he calls it Rahala Stapa, so I don't know if that's going to... It's pretty, pretty cool, magic button. Um, so, uh, it is great to be in Exeter. It's a beautiful city, and there's not much to uh, take the piss out of here, I have to say. Uh, I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> it's going to be hard for me. I like it. Um, it's, uh, I was looking at the local news. I looked at that everywhere, and it's very slow-paced here in Exeter. I would, I would, I would like to... The, the local news today uh, is that blood was left on the street after a late-night incident... 
outside the Tesco Metro last night. I don't know if you saw, did anyone see the blood? I mean, the way that's reported, it sounds like someone's just come and left like a cup of blood <laughs> on the floor for any passing vampires. Um, it's not known how the blood found its way there. That is, if anyone knows, <laughs> do it. It was cleaned up at 9.30 a.m. <laughs> That is the Exeter New. That's that we're living in the middle of a city. Someone's cut themselves. <laughs> uh, it's an exciting. It is an exciting place. You've had that. You used to have the oldest hotel in the country. <laughs> Still a little bit of it left. Um, you had the funniest uh, terrorist attack there has ever been in Exeter. <laughs> so well done for that. Where a man attempted a suicide bomb. A a uh, branch of giraffe uh, in Exeter. I mean, it was very niche. It was always going to be very niche. Uh, thankfully, or, I mean, you know, he, uh, it didn't work, uh, although he did manage to... It's a comedy uh, terrorist act because he blew himself up in the toilet and didn't even kill himself. So, uh, on that occasion. So, uh, it's... Uh, he, is, he is now dead. He is, you'll be glad to hear. <laughs> he, managed, he didn't take anyone with him. So that's Exeter. That was the most exciting thing that's happened in Exeter. A house moved down the street. That was in 1961. They still talk about it. Uh, it's got the narrowest street in the world, Parliament Street, allegedly. I think they put that sign up and found out it wasn't true. So uh, <laughs> they changed their minds. Uh, and house to move. That's all. And, and some tunnels underground that uh, got quite a lot of one star reviews on people from people on TripAdvisor. <laughs> who seemed disappointed that the tunnels were quite small and wet. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're going to crack straight on with our first, only guest this week, our only guest this week. We only have one guest a week, as you know. And um, she's probably best known for being the author of The Prophet Haldar and The Stuff of State. That's why we're all here. I hope you've all read that before you came out, because that is all we're going to be talking about. Please welcome from Exeter University, Professor Francesca Stavrakalpulu, ladies and gentlemen. What's, uh, what's the best bit? What's the take-home bit in the Prophet Halder and the Stuff of State? Would you say what was the... I love it that you picked out probably one of my most obscure publications. I did. It's yeah, like and I'm I really pleased that you did that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the most important thing is that she's a woman and that she's got a name in the Bible because there's right. not many of them. <laughs> so that's quite important. But I've got an interesting fact for you. I was okay. listening to you just now. Yes. And you were talking about Parliament Street being the littlest street in Exeter. Yes. It used to be called something different. It was renamed. It did, and I saw this. It you know was, this. I'm amazed remember. you've not mentioned it. Uh, it used to be called uh, Tiny Poo Street. No. <laughs> but I did, I did look this up, and I, haven't, I can't remember. Go on, what will tell me? Cunt Grape Street. Oh, was it one yeah. of those? No, yeah. I didn't get that. I oh, sorry, I've, Mum. Damn, I've done it already. I don't remember <laughs> that. You did you'd pr predict you would be ruder before I was, so well done. <laughs> You've succeeded. Um, so you are the... What's your official title? You're the prof uh, professor... Professor of Hebrew Bible and Ancient Religion. So yeah. basically, Hebrew Bible is what other people call the Old Testament. Yeah. And Ancient Religion is religion that's ancient. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm very, I, I, don't, I don't know if the people who are Exeter are particularly interested in this subject, but I am. So that's why, <laughs> that's why you... <laughs> I like the new. I'm more into the New Testament than the Old Testament. It's yeah, kinda, a lot of people say that I until kinda, they read the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, Old Testament. It's quite boring. The Old Testament, though. Oh, behave! Have you, like, <laughs> seriously? Firstly, it's this big compared yeah. to the New Testament, which is this big. That's what I like. Secondly, New Testament <laughs> yeah. says the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, which is boring. Well, it doesn't because it says it slightly differently, and then you have to try and work out what really. Yeah, happened. that's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So who wrote the... Was it God who wrote the Bible? Yeah, no. no okay. No, no. I'd trick you. It was you're, lots of people. You're, a, you're an atheist, a yeah. biblical scholar. Yeah. I should probably say, yeah. So... Uh, yeah. What kind of people were they who wrote the Bible? Do we know, do we know anything... Have we any idea who they were? Not really. Well, if you want to talk about the New Testament, we know that Paul was basically... Had all sorts of issues. I mean, huge issues. <laughs> yeah. Firstly, he was Jewish and then but was persecuting just a group of Jews because obviously Christianity started off as a Jewish sect because mm -hmm. um, Jesus was Jewish, everyone was Jewish. So Paul had his own issues. I think he was basically a frustrated scholar. Um, he was also bald and he also talks about himself as being not... He, he's not very... He, see, I say this, stumbling. He couldn't speak very well right. um, publicly. So I think he had various issues. Um, he was 
quite a short man, I always imagine. Yeah. Short and a bit nervous. There's nothing wrong with being short. No, no, nothing. <laughs> but I think, you know, it, it, it didn't make him feel great. <laughs> okay. Um, so we know a bit about him. Yeah. But basically, he was a bit of a... He liked to say different things to different people when it suited him at different times. Okay. And he spends the whole time saying, but honestly, I know you think this, but I can tell you that I know the way that, you know, never met Jesus, never met him. He met, he met him on the road to Damascus. He came out of the sky He's and said... He's got a like... flash of light in his eyes and he <laughs> fell over. That's not meeting Jesus. <laughs> Best you're going to get now. <laughs> Unless he can't, he might be back. If he's here, he, it probably would be in Exeter if he's going to come back. <laughs> There's a few, the few here that might think they are anyway, let's face it. <laughs> um, so, um, well, you wrote a book about uh, the, uh, God and anatomy. Yeah, that's so, coming out next year. Yeah, so what, how, what's the anatomy? Uh, so basically our market, and this is going to be like a book, rather than a book written for other scholars like me, which only ever get read by about six other people and your PhD students, because you make them read those. It's like it's going to be the kind of book that's in Waterstones and yeah. on Amazon and stuff. I would say I would have read some of your books, but I looked them up on Amazon. And they were thirty-five pounds each. So I thought, fuck it, I'll just yeah. ask you about them. Hard they look back, quite complicated. Hardback, sixty quid. Yeah, I know. So, so this, this is, is coming about, out. Yeah, it's coming out next year, and it's basically um, arguing about the God of the Bible, so both Hebrew Bible and New Testament. And it's arguing that originally um, people thought that God had a body and it's basically what was his body like and what did it do and all its different parts mm -hmm. and how come he doesn't have a body anymore and how has that impacted our own sense of our bodies today? And is there a whole chapter about his cock? Because <laughs> that's all that we want to know about. Babe, there's five chapters about his cock and they're the longest. <laughs> Because I had a question in Christ on a Bike was, you know, how long was Jesus' cock? Cause... Yeah, well, Jesus was small because he was circumcised. Well, that's not, that's not they're cutting the end off. They no, they but compared, take, to, still... compared to God, his father, who's... Well, he's up in heaven, so he's really enormous. big. His cock was enormous. Yeah. God's cock was. Okay. I've said it so many well, times. Well, the baby Jesus, but the baby Jesus grew up, and it must have been a certain... But it's an interesting theological question. I think you could write a book about this, because Jesus' cock must have been a certain length, and it must have been pre... God must have sat down and thought, how long is it going to be? Yeah, but, is it going to be a big one because he's God or is the, does the true Messiah have a humble cock? Interestingly, like we're not the first... Yeah. <laughs> well, we're not the first people to wonder about this. So no. Jesus was a good Jew, as I said, and rabbis at the time of Jesus were talking about, well, you know, how do we know what God's penis looks like? And we, we must know that God's penis was circumcised because we're circumcised and we're circumcised because our ancestors are circumcised and they're circumcised because Adam was circumcised. And Adam is circumcised because he was made in the image of God, which means that God was circumcised. So in that sense, Jesus was probably relatively well hung and, <laughs> and looked a lot like his divine dad. Okay. What happened to God's foreskin when they circumcised? <laughs> Who did it? Did he circumcise himself? Quite often. So you get in a lot of the Greek myths as well, yeah. and in Greek retellings of Phoenician myths, where yeah. the gods basically do circumcise themselves. Okay. Um, which some later Christian theologians try to imitate people like Origen and supposedly end up castrating themselves accidentally rather than circumcising themselves. Yeah. But I'm sure that's myth. Um, but, but yeah, so basically... It's a God difficult thing to do for yourself, that's the thing. I think with... You want someone else to do the circumcision. If you do it yourself, you just get distracted. Yeah. You could lose a bit more than you mean to. It does happen sometimes. Um, but we know what happened to Jesus' foreskin because there's loads of myths that talk about Jesus' own foreskin because that's the only detail the Bible gives us about what he looked like. It doesn't tell us, you know, how tall he was or what colour his hair was or if he had a beard or not, blah, blah, blah. But the one detail it tells us about his physical body was that he was circumcised when he was eight days old, which right. was, you know, Jewish custom. So you get all these myths growing up very quickly after the death of Jesus that talk about what happened to his foreskin. And there's lots of them around still, aren't there? There's, there's loads. He had about ten. Yeah. <laughs> <There's lots laughs> and in fact, the, la the latest one that we knew about, it disappeared from a village in Italy in about 1984. And there was a regular festival that was held every year that sort of processed his, his foreskin around. And because, um, you know, it's a bit of Jesus, that's fine. So it was a proper relic, but it went missing when the priest alerted, the priest in this village where this festival was held, he alerted the police and said, I've been robbed. The burglars have broken in and they've gone into my wardrobe in my bedroom and they've ransacked the shoebox where I kept Jesus' foreskin for safety. <laughs> And I think they're, you know, ruffians that have done this. And then all this rumour started up in the Italian press saying that it was dark forces in the Vatican that had stolen Jesus' foreskin. Yeah. That's they they might have thought it was a polo. <laughs> 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 
Maybe yeah. one of the fruit ones, yeah. Do you think... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be difficult to ask you emergency questions because I want to concentrate on the Bible, so I'm trying to adapt some. Do you think God has ever tried to suck his own cock? I saw you do this with Mary, <laughs> Mary <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm good at um, adapting No, I think he had lots of other people to do that for him. Well, he didn't to begin with. He was on his own, wasn't no, he? No, but no, but that's what you think, but he wasn't. He wasn't. If you read the Bible in the Hebrew <laughs> and in the Greek, you can clearly see he wasn't on his own. He had a wife. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we want, I wanted to talk about his wife. Yeah. So what was his wife called? Asherah. Okay, and why is, why is she not in the Bible? Is she in the Bible at all? Is yeah, she she's mentioned over 40 times in the okay. Bible, but always... She's always vilified, like God always saying, no, 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 don't put that statue of Asherah next to my altar. <laughs> don't put that statue of, of Asherah in my temple. That's very naughty. Right. So it's basically vilifying her in a, in a, as a means of trying to change, edit the past. Yeah. Or he broke up and he had a bad divorce and didn't want her around anymore. It was pretty, he was pretty yeah. horrible to her, yeah. Yeah. Well, because it, that, in the prehistory, like with religions, they were largely either celebrating male and male and females or quite female led religions, weren't they? There was a lot of the fecundity of women was the Yeah, the but symbol fertility of was just as important for, for male yeah. and masculine deities as it was female. So yeah, the, but there were always lots of gods because it, it, I mean it you know, it doesn't really make sense. This is the problem that the Bible's got. So you start off with a God who's supposedly on his own, who's so lonely he has to invent people. And then they screw up, obviously, chucks them out of the Garden of Eden. And then he's so lonely again that he has to go and talk to Abraham, who's in Mesopotamia. He's not even, not even Jewish. He's in Mesopotamia <laughs> and says, will you be my friend? By the way, you need to, you know, circumcise yourself in order yeah. to be my friend. So there's this whole kind of... <laughs> so everything bad that happens is basically because God's a bit sort of... He's just a bit fickle, kind of, you know, he likes people and not that much. I'm going to kill them all with a flood. Oh, no, now I'm going to save them again. Oh, now I'm going to kill them again. Yeah. Whereas in a polytheistic system, so in other words, when you've got lots of deities, all the kind of bad stuff that happens in the cosmos can be blamed on confrontation in the heavens between different groups of gods yeah. rather than confrontation between God and humans. Yeah, makes a lot more sense. That's why I I'm, completely agree. That's why I'm, I, I'm a very Roman. I, I like the Roman gods. They're, they're my fellas uh, and ladies. Um, uh, so, but you, you, you think um, it's not a very historical book, really, the Bible as it comes. You're, you're saying that none of the made. Did Abraham exist as no. a, a person? No. A human being? And Moses didn't exist? No. David didn't exist. I've watched your program. Yeah, you, no, don't I don't think, think David did. existed. But a lot of scholars are disagreeing with you about David. But um, there are some historians. So we know that there's later on some of David's descendants. We know that they existed, so certain kings like Hezekiah and Manasseh and, and various others. So once yeah. you get to like the 8th century BCE, you're kind of on safer ground. But okay. it's just before that that it's very improbable. Yeah. Well, I was watching your, your hidden uh, Bible... Bible is very secret. Yeah. Uh, from a few years ago, and the, the first one's about David, and the, 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 there aren't any monuments or any kind of... Men There's one mention of him from about 150 years after... He yeah. might have lived. Yeah, so it's one inscription, and a lot of scholars are really excited about it, particularly a lot of Israeli scholars and Jewish scholars and Christian scholars, um, because, you know, it's one reference to the House of David. So, like, we would talk about the House of Tudor or the House of Stuart in, in English and Scottish culture, so the House of David. But it's about 150 years later, and, you know, it, it doesn't prove that David himself existed. It, you know, I, I do think that there was a monarchy in Jerusalem that, and that perhaps David was a legendary founder, like King Arthur was a legendary founder. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of a, a case of that rather than proof that David was there. Right. But Moses, you know, how can you say he didn't exist? He was found in the bulrushes. He had an exodus out of Egypt. He piped the Red Sea. Who piped the Red Sea if Moses wasn't there? Well, That's my question. question to you. Yeah, it's, it's a good yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, to be completely geeky, in the earliest kind of poem that we have, like the earliest text in the Bible about the parting of the Reed Sea, so it's a misnomer in English translations ah. based on the ancient Greek. So it's actually the Sea of Reeds, not the Red Sea. That's easier, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I could do that. So basically, <laughs> you're talking about a pond. Yeah. <laughs> but in that earliest text, it, it, it's a poem, and, and it's, it's Yahweh, it's God that does the whole dividing right. up the sea thing not not Moses but you know but but thing is Moses is playing lots of other different and important roles which we ought not to underplay yeah um you know for the sake of parity he's he, you know he was uh, mm, a magician 
probably. Yeah. Okay. He's drawn on the idea of a magician. He does all sorts of other stuff. So it's not just the whole sea thing. No. Obviously, he gives, you know, he's the one that kind of gives people Torah, which is the law or the Ten Commandments. Yeah, take, went is, up a mountain, got the Ten Commandments. Yeah, it's a pretty important job. I, I did a routine, a, quite a long routine about the Ten Commandments and went back and looked at the Ten Commandments. And they're quite, when you look at them, they're quite surprising. There's a lot about slavery in there. You'd think that would be, that slavery's kind of okay. You'd think that would be one of the commandments. They're very Tory. There's a lot about house yeah. ownership and possessions yeah. and stuff like that as well, which you kind of think, hmm. Yeah. Well, four of them are just about how you've got to say God's brilliant. It's yeah. very insecure, those first four. Yeah. And they feel really like they've been written by someone's mum and dad, I think. Because the honour thy mother and thy father bit. Yeah, come on, someone slip that in. Just to, you know, look, you've got to honour me. Or you, you. <laughs> That's kind of about ancestor worship, though, which yeah. is quite interesting. So it's about honouring them, because that's the only commandment that um, has any sort of direct link to about territoriality and landedness. And so there's a sense in which, when it says honour your mother and father, there's a sense in which venerating them, the dead you know, dead ancestors yeah. will kind of stake your claim to the land. And we know that that's, that's a very common feature of a lot of sort of pre-industrial, pre-monotheism religions. But right. you're absolutely right. The rest of the Ten Commandments are basically, really like me, please like me, don't do this, don't do that. Even the stuff about, you know, don't envy somebody else's donkey. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> basically God could have written that himself because he was quite jealous. Yeah. And look after your slaves. Give your slaves a day off. Be nice to your slaves. <laughs> There's, well, there's no slaves in the Ten Commandments. They are. It's all, it's all about the slaves. No, that's because you're reading it in the context of Exodus, but that, that didn't really okay. happen. It says slaves in the one I'm reading. I'm reading the English Bible, the proper one. Oh, my one. God. Well, you need to... I'm reading the <laughs> we need proper... To talk about I'm reading the proper English Bible written by... By King uh, James. English God. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he's English. Um, I know with the New Testament, there's a lot of apocryphal texts that didn't make it in. Yeah. Is that, is that true of the Old Testament as well? Is there yeah, like... there's loads of stuff that didn't make it into the Old Testament. Why, like... How do they, what, what are the reason things don't, didn't make it in and what is the maddest stuff that didn't make it in? Because there's some mad stuff about Jesus. In the New Testament, some yeah. of the maddest stuff is that when he was a child, Jesus was a, a child killer, which is my favourite story. So quite a lot of the early Gospels and epistles that didn't make it into the final collection um, talk about Jesus basically discovering his powers as he's growing up. And one of the things he does is that he goes up onto the roof... Um, with a, lo a load of other kids and pushes one of the children off and kills him and then brings him back to life again just because he can. You would. Which he would, yeah. of course. Um, when he helps his dad, Joseph the carpenter, out in his carpentry shop and sort of like lengthens bits of wood and, wood and stuff for right. him. He does, he does things like, you know, creates clay sparrows and, and that kind of thing yeah. um, and brings them to life and then kills them again. He does a lot of killing and <laughs> to the point where parents complain to Jesus's mum and say your son is killing our children you've got to do something about him so those are some of the stories that that don't get in and do you turn all the kids into goats or something yeah he turns well? a lot of kids into animals yeah but then later on some of the other apocryphal stories about growing up Jesus is that when after he's resurrected and then ascended to heaven he suddenly appears in the marital in the kind of the, the bridal suite of this couple that have just got married because you would because you would <laughs> And starts telling them not to have sex wow. and basically saying that the vagina and the breasts are, are demonic and that there's no way that they should be oh, you got penetrated. Because that was the good thing about Jesus, he died so young, but then he carried on living, got middle-aged and went mad, didn't he? <laughs> Started, <laughs> that's what happened to a lot of my friends. They started saying, getting to the, <laughs> getting the 50, start saying stuff like that. Um, <laughs> And so how, why are those, are those things not in because someone went, oh no, that's crazy, we can't have those in, or is it, who made that decision about what goes into the Bible and the New Testament? Yeah, well, we don't know who made the decision. There's a tradition that the decision was made by a group of bishops, like in about sort of a third-ish century, but we don't really know, that's just legend. Basically, the reason why some things go in and some things don't is because some things just were more popular than others. So this is the beginning of what we call the codex or the book, so... Mm -hmm. Before that, things were written on wax tablets or boards or on papyrus scrolls or, or leather scrolls. And by this point, you, you start to get the beginnings of a codex, which is like what we know as a folded book. So that made literature much more able to travel. It was much more mobile. So the four Gospels, for example, as we have them in the New Testament, they seem to have been the ones that got really popular really quickly across lots of different communities mm -hmm. around you know, Syria and Palestine and, and obviously the Mediterranean and stuff. But then there were others that were really, really popular, but then not so much because morally or ethically they were a bit dodge, like, you know, like Jesus killing other kids and stuff. Yeah. 
but more because you know they, they may not have just had the kind of patronage that some of this other literature had. So without a rich backer, right. you don't get published. Because someone's just copying them all out by hand in a cave somewhere. Is that basically well, how it no, works? Well, no, they weren't cave dwellers. They were very sophisticated okay. people. They, they hid them in caves. So they did hid the Dead Sea Scrolls in caves, <laughs> okay. and then they hid some of the Nag Hammadi texts, some of okay. the these New Testament texts, were, were admittedly put on a rubbish dump. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm quite obsessed with the genealogy of Christ and I've learned it all off by heart and can do it backwards and forwards. <laughs> Which is more than of, Jesus can do. How many, <laughs> how many of those are real? So if we, Abraham, uh, Abraham begat Isaac, neither of them real eyes begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas's brethren, Judas begat Pharez and Zara of Tamar, Zara begat, uh, Pharez begat Ezra, Ezra begat Aram, Aram begat Aminadab. You're good at that. Uh, Minadab got Booz of Rakab. Is he Booz of Rakab? Or, 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 I love Booz of Rakab. <laughs> he's my favourite <laughs> favorite one. Uh, Booz, we got Obed of Rufo, we got Jesse, Jesse, we got David the King, David the King, got Solomon of Heard, been the wife of Arias. Solomon, we got Rebo- Reboam. Reboam? Reboam, no. Oh, come on, that's a good name. No, yeah, but it's a good name, but no. Yeah, Reboam, we got Asa, Asa, we got Abby, Abby, we got uh, Joe, uh, Joatham, Joe, Joatham, we Joe, uh, oh, I've missed that Ozzyus, I think. Ozzyus, Jotham, Joe, Jotham. Got... I'm going to have to start again. <laughs> <laughs> this sometimes happens when I get to that stage. So how far down do we, do we get to... Who, who's the first real one? Is Jaconius and, Jaconius and his brethren, about the time they were taken away to Babylon, after they were taken to Babylon, Jaconius got Salatha, or Salatha got Zorobabel, <laughs> Zorobabel got Abbey, yeah, Abbey once got they're away and... into Babylon, you're Do you not have to learn this was on, on the first day of university what, of biblical the, studies? Of go, school. do you know the first page of Matthew? <laughs> no. well, don't fuck off back until you've learned this. Richard Herring knows it, <laughs> more, more or less, and he can do that. But acronym. I will show my students this yeah. and say, this is what's possible. Joseph, is Joseph real? I'm not, I don't is know Jesus about real? Joseph. Jesus, probably, yeah. Mm. And probably his mum, yeah. Mary, or Miriam, or Mariam, or however she was, she, whatever she was called. But yeah, probably. But I, you know, and there are other figures in that genealogy that probably are real. I mean, yeah. that genealogy is deliberately trying to make him out to have royal descent. So yes. that's why he comes through David and everything. But, which is the weird thing, isn't it? Obviously, because it's trying to give him date royal descent through his paternal line. Yeah. But then we find out that, Joseph's not his dad. Exactly. Which is one of the first theological problems. Yeah. Also, if you go back that many generations, Danny Dyer's related to royalty, isn't he? Yeah. So it <laughs> doesn't mean anything. I believe that. And then my friend Adam Rutherford has said that basically we're all related to royalty. Yeah, of course, because you go back that far. There weren't, that, there weren't millions of people back in the no. past, were there? So the minute you get back 16, 20 generations, we're all, everyone, we, you, if you can trace it, that's quite impressive. But then when they found Richard the Third under the car park. Love him. My, uh, do you know what? My sister... I, I love it to bits, but my sister, the day that they made that announcement about yeah. Richard III being discovered under the car park, she, she texted me and she said, but why did they bury him under a car park? <laughs> like, she meant it in all seriousness, and it was the funniest thing she's ever said to yeah, me. That's good. That's true. But they did DNA, te- DNA testing on him, and some of them didn't match up because, obviously, the, the, everyone was fucking around, weren't they? Yeah. Look at Princess Diana. <gasps> so... Um, <laughs> She didn't do that, and that is the, the, the one person who proves the rule. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, I, you know, I know you're more... I mean, what, what's the... Well, let's talk about the Old Testament. Yes. I mean, you know, that, they're all those people I know who don't exist, I've wasted my time learning their names. Um, what do you think... I mean, what's, what do you think is the craziest thing in the Old Testament of all the, out of all the stories in the Old Testament? The craziest? Yeah. Oh, my God, there's so many. I mean, there's Ezekiel, God telling Ezekiel that he has to cook on human poo and then eat it. Right. Just because he makes him. There's, <laughs> there's things like, my, one of my favourite stories is, it's quite one, it's Elisha and the bears, which is in the Book of Kings. And um, Elisha's bald. This is not a, I'm sorry, this is not an attack on bald men. This is just a... Um, <laughs> So Sorry, he's have bald. a go at the board, just leave the short guys alone. That's what I'm saying. That's all I so, so being bald in the ancient world was basically the equivalent of not... of, of I suppose it has similarities to, to some sort of polemics today, but you weren't considered to be particularly hyper-masculine. And so Elisha's walking along and he's bald. And to be a proper like man in the ancient world, you had to be like tall and hairy and kind of have a red face and a big beard and stuff like that. Um, and Elisha's just some guy who's got no hair. 
And so these little kids come running out of, the, of Bethel and they go, ha, baldy, baldy, baldy. <laughs> so they basically might as well have been saying, you've got a limp dick. Yeah. It's basically the same thing. And so basically God's not without a sense of irony. So because it's an attack on Elisha's masculinity and his hairlessness, he decides to call out a load of female hairy bears from the forest, which always makes me laugh. And they maul the children and they shred 42 of them. <laughs> 42. 42 kids. Which is kind of crazy, because you think it's a bit of an overreaction, yeah. just for calling to saying that somebody's got no hair and, yeah. and well, might be Kids don't impotent. come out of the, you know, kids have a hard time, don't they? The <laughs> King Herod. I know. Well, they did have a tough kids. time with Herod. But yeah. Herod's just trying to kind of... Firstly, Herod was very insecure. He probably existed. Yeah. And he was very insecure because he was of mixed parentage. And we all, you know, speaking from experience, it's very hard being mixed parentage sometimes. <laughs> okay. And, and so he... Are you trying, have you killed a load of kids and you just, this is what we're leading up to? <laughs> to be fair. Every now and again, you just kill your friend's there's children. There's time yet, there's time yeah. yet. But he's, he's got issues. And so he's trying to... It's his own kind of ethnic cleansing. So I'm not saying that the, the actual killing of the children is historical, but Herod was. So he's got all sorts of issues going on. But, but that's quite a powerful story. But the thing is, Herod, or the story writer, is riffing off the idea that it was God himself that had killed a whole load of firstborn Egyptian babies back with Moses and the Exodus. Right. So you get this, like, repetition of motifs. So, yeah, Herod probably wasn't as bad as we think he is. I always felt very sorry for Herod in the, in the nativity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, he's a bad guy in the nativity. I mean, I think if you, was, if you were doing... If these things were happening... Yeah. I mean, but, I, but they're not meant... To, it's not meant to be history when it's... The, the readers of it aren't reading it as history in the, in the originally, right? But if, if a star was appearing in the sky indicating a single dwelling in a village, mm. I mean, it, that stars are pretty big, and it would have to be quite low down <laughs> to, to point at one. You'd think that would have made some other history book somewhere in the world going, oh, there was that time when that star that came. That star came. came and, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it was doing, but it didn't bother following it. Um, <laughs> seemed a waste of time. Um, so, I mean, these stories can't have happened, surely, because they would have made, you know, most of them would have, most of them are so incredible that somebody else would have gone, oh, there was that great time when the... Yeah, but the thing is, like, I always say to my students that the biblical writers, they're not trying to deceive their audience, they're not trying to lie, it's just that they had a very different way, like, ancient people had a very different way of seeing the world and interpreting what was real and what wasn't real than we do, and that's not to say that they were stupid, it's just that they just had a different understanding of what history was, so... They think that there's this, there's this amazing man who was crucified and they decided... So that's the so earliest Christian writings we have are in, are in Paul's writings in the New Testament. He doesn't mention Jesus' birth or life at all. All that he cares about is that Jesus died and was resurrected and is God. So you get all this kind of filler having to come. We're like, well, well, how come? You know, who was he? Who was he? So the Gospels are written after Paul's writings. So that's when you get the kind of embellishment of... Oh, yeah, you know, well, he was from Galilee, and that's and in, and in, and in the biblical world, Galilee was where all the stupid people came from. Right. So it's a bit of a cuss, like, to start with, to say yeah. that, you know, that's where Jesus was from. And so you get all this kind of embellishment, and so you end up saying, well, he must have been born to this special life and death. Right. And so, that of course, he would have had this kind of heavenly star over his birthplace. Yeah, and they're trying to fulfil Old Testament prophecies exactly. within, within yeah. what they're writing, yeah. so they'll, 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 they'll make things... I think, like in the story where the guy gets his ear cut off in Gethsemane, that's, yeah. that they, they give him a name, which you think that one would they wouldn't, that one would have said what's. By the way, mate, before we before we go on, what was your name so I can write that in the book? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But his name, his name, because his his name's given because it fulfills a prophecy about someone with that name. I think. Yeah, and, and so it, and and it is that kind of thing that that the biblical writers because they were Jewish. The first Christians were Jewish, and so you have to have a head sense that these written traditions in Judaism, ancient Judaism, were so important that you can't suddenly have this guy sort of saying, I think that that guy Jesus that was crucified, you know, as a criminal, and whose body's probably been thrown into a, a mass grave, which is what happened to criminals' bodies when they were executed and taken down. Yeah. So you can't have somebody, you know, just say that he was, he was a nobody. You have to sort of say, well, I think our ancestors kind of knew that something like this was going to happen. And yeah. so, of course, you're going to rake through the past to, to find evidence to support it. Sure. And it, it doesn't feel to me like even in the Bible that Jesus was trying to start up a new religion. He was very concerned no. with, Ju with Judaism yeah. and, and reforming Judaism maybe and, and pointing out where Judaism was wrong. But that doesn't seem the actions of someone who's trying to 
No, I create think he'd a be new religion. Spinning in his grave yeah. if he knew what was going on in his yeah. name. So yeah, he definitely wasn't. He was he was a, a good Jew. He was quite a ferocious Jew. But you know, he was you know, it may be that if he wasn't married, we don't know, but if he wasn't married, he may have been a part of this John the Baptist kind of desert dwelling ascetic cult that kind of you know, didn't want to have any worldly possessions. And there were all sorts of people like that, different religious groups like that, in Judaism and outside of it mm -hmm. at the time. So I think he was, yeah, I think he was a bit of a, a geezer. And I think probably him going in, you know, the thing that gets him arrested is when he goes to Jerusalem at Passover, which, you know, any kind of festival, I mean, just look at Exeter at Christmas, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, any kind of festival, heightened tensions and everyone's a bit, you know, giddy goes into the temple and he kicks off the temple and like kicks over tables and yeah. all that kind of stuff that's exactly the kind of shit that will get you arrested by the romans <laughs> yeah. so he probably did that you know he or his followers probably did that but not because they're trying to kind of claim that the temple is about to be usurped because you know jesus's body is going to replace the temple but because they were you know kicking off about the kind of things that the protesters kick off about today mm -hmm. he would just write a review on TripAdvisor like the people do now about Extra cathedrals charging twelve pounds to get in. I'm pretty pissed off about that one star. And if he'd done that, they'd had TripAdvisor back then. He'd probably still be alive today. Probably. That's the, that's the, that's the tragedy of it all. What brought you to Exeter? Did you do something wrong in your academic career that you had to come to Exeter? Um, I got a, it was it, I got a job and thought I would leave after a couple of years. Yeah. But it turned out that my colleagues are quite nice, most of them. Okay. <laughs> Is it nice here, Exeter? It's a long way, isn't it? It's a long way from all the important stuff. I grew up in London, so yeah, yeah I do I do find it. It's beautiful living here. I, I really is. And it's like going on safari every time you drive anywhere. It's like there's sheep and cows and stuff everywhere, which I really enjoy. But yeah, yeah. it's what I do 50 like it. 50% uh, less away. car accidents than anywhere else in the country in Exeter. That's because there's always sheep on the road. So and nothing no, there are no cars here. <laughs> Cut. Um, let's get back to. Let's. I thought I'd just diss Exeter for a bit, but no, they, they didn't like it. This, this stuff worked brilliantly in Plymouth. <laughs> I loved it. Um, <laughs> and so there's. It's a, it, I, I'm sort of interested in the way religion became very patriarchal and became very male based, which is basically because of the Bible, right? And it's sort of that's where that's where that's what turned. Religions were, were matriarchal or, or celebrating. Well, no. Well, no. Do you not See, think so? No, because that, there was that... Uh, let me preface this by saying I am a feminist, but there was a big feminist movement within a lot of academia in the 1970s and 80s that basically argued that, in terms of history of religions, that religion started off as being very matriarchal and it was all about the celebration of the female body and that basically as soon as writing started, accountancy, which was how writing was invented, it was basically trying to keep a track of who had what and who bought what for what, um, it became very anal and, and very patriarchal. But I, I, I think that's a very fake, it's a, it's a very fake dichotomy to draw between like this matriarchy and patriarchy stuff. I think there's always been a very gender fluid idea of what deities and divinities are. Um, so you've got it's a scale, you know, very, very, very masculine and very, very, very feminine and yeah. everything in between. And so I think it was less that it was matriarchal and then became patriarchal and more that it was always about reflecting human communities and human, you know, small communities in yeah. which you obviously have a mix of people and a mix of genders. And gradually as time went on, I think probably as, yeah, as writing became more important to authorising power and basically once temples start to become cities rather than just temples i think that's when you get a shift towards a more a more masculinized idea of power so you've still got goddesses and and sort of gender queer deities and all sorts but you tend to have the big the the one with the power is is a more masculine deity yeah but did they did these religions that all sprung up around that time uh, and that we still have now. Um, do, do you think they uh, have influenced the the you know the, the patriarchal nature of yes, our, our society? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, as soon as you get to as soon as the Bible becomes an authoritative text or a bit of the Bible, so whether it's Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, yeah. or whether it's the Hebrew Scriptures or the New Testament or the Quran, as soon as you get a collection of texts that become authoritative, not just religiously but socially and culturally. 
And the Bible, whether we like it or not, is still a cultural icon in the West today, whether we believe it or not. So, yeah, it's got a very masculinized understanding of what the divine is. And, you know, and God, whether it's Allah or whether it's Yahweh or whether it's God or Theos in the New Testament, he's, he's a guy. Yeah. And, and that means that human men are like God in ways that human women are not like God. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. It's good. It's good. It's a good point. It's a good point. <laughs> How you put it that way? Yeah, is that they were right to. I mean, and again, Paul was didn't seem to like women very much. No. no. Well, I think I reckon Jesus probably liked women. That's my guess. I think I'm not sure. I'm not sure about Jesus because it looks like there probably was something going on with him and whatever the Mary, whoever the Mary Magdalene figure yeah. is, based on. Yeah. You know, because you, he had you women. You studied the Da Vinci Code in part yeah. of your part of your. It's core, that's core reading. Be core reading. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, he had a lot of women in his following, and yeah. it was probably the women that that supported and paid financially, paid for for his little movement to to yeah. to exist. But I think Paul is somebody. You know, he talks. He Paul thought that basically the world was about to end, like any minute, literally yeah. any minute. So he thought there's no point in having sex because there's no point in having children because the heavenly realm is about to crash into the earthly realm and like sweep the whole earthly realm away. We're all, all the righteous ones that believe in Jesus are all going to get swept up into this new heavenly realm where we're not even going to have bo bodies, like proper bodies anymore. We're going to be asexual. So there won't be any sex in heaven. And God's like, <laughs> that's what you think. Because <laughs> um, he's been doing it for centuries. But anyway, that's, a, that's in the book. Um, so when, when the end of the world doesn't happen, so Paul spent all this time saying there's no point in having sex. It's like we don't need children. Yeah. So he keeps telling everybody to abstain from sex and not get married, or if you do want to have sex, get married, but don't do it, don't do, don't have sex too often. So the world doesn't end, and yet Christians still keep believing and Christians still keep having kids. And so you're kind of like, mm, what's the deal with the whole sex thing and the marriage thing? Yeah. See, I would I'm the opposite of Paul. If the heavens are about to crash into the earth, I'd say that'd be a good reason to have loads of sex <laughs> with people that aren't my wife. So I'd There's say, some estimates that say that it'll probably take about half an hour for yeah, the heavens to crash into that's the enough, earth. That's enough. That's like, like you know, I can get four or five in by that time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, also, if it's going to, you know, that's the great time. There's no repercussions to sex, is there? If the world's going to end, what's he thinking? Paul's a fucking idiot. Well, Paul was because like he was, and the thing is, Paul was Jewish, and actually, Jewish ancient Jewish attitudes to sex were far more like all oh, liberal attitudes than, than Christian attitudes came to be. So they were far more, it was all about pleasure. Sex was all about, I mean, obviously, you know, don't deliberately go and kind of screw over a lot of people literally and, and well, literally. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it was much more, it was about female pleasure as well as male pleasure and stuff like that. Whereas Christians just got such a massive hang up about it so quickly. Yeah. And that's mostly to do with Paul and then Augustine. St. Augustine, who basically says that, you know, women are, and their vaginas are the, the gateway to hell. Mm. In a good way, though. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I just put a different spin on both those guys. <laughs> but St. Augustine was, wasn't he the one that was fucking everyone and then went at the end, oh, give me, give me chastity, but not yet, wasn't that, was he that yeah, guy? He, yeah, he had quite a, he basically shagged his way around yeah. North Africa for good, some He was a good guy. There's, there should be more saints those. like that. <laughs> Not Francis of Assisi with animals, what a waste of time. <laughs> um, so with your, because it's it's, it is obviously a history you're looking at, so you're, you go to these places and, and, and you're doing archaeology and, and looking at the archaeology there, is that, that's all part of your yeah. job? Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what places have you, which kind of religious places have you been to and seen? Oh my God, really? Yeah. Where oh, have you been? Every, everywhere, like yeah. all across the Middle East. And now, the, but the places that I love the most have now been destroyed since ISIS kind of rampaged across Syria. And that's devastating. Yeah. I mean, properly flattened. I mean, obviously, a huge amount of human life has been lost in Syria. So I was last there in 2010, just a few months before the war in Syria started. And since then, just. The most, I mean, we're not just talking about Palmyra here, which was obviously a really important site, but is particularly well known for its Greco Roman mm -hmm. um, monuments. But we're talking about, you know, temples and sacred places that have been standing since like the 14th century BCE, like the 16th century BCE. And, and they've just been absolutely flattened, as well as the museums being looted and plundered and smashed. And it's just devastating. Yeah. Like properly devastating. 
But it's sort of, it's weird, isn't it, that all these books are the reason, you know, if, if all this stuff is essentially made up and it's about trying to, you know, create a history and create a property rights and all these books are still 2,000 years on creating these situations mm. and there doesn't seem to be any way out of making people, you know, you can't go to ISIS and say, by the way, all of that's made up, that stuff. Yeah, definitely not me. You know? <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, fellas, just calm down. Um, it's sort of, it's sort of weird. It's 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 it's, 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 it's incre- you know they, they couldn't have pre- pre- I mean if they thought the world was going to end anyway they wouldn't have predicted. But it's incredible to think that we're we're still so in the sway of those stories from from so long ago from such a specific region. Yeah, I mean, and I understand that the past matters, and I understand that cultural heritage, whether it's religious or social or whatever, I understand that that matters. Of course, it does. But at the same time, I think we need to recognise that whether it's the Quran or the Bible or Tanakh, these texts are human products. They're not divine products. They didn't fall out of the sky. And we need to be able to treat them not necessarily irreverently. And I know I've not exactly modelled that particularly well tonight. But, but you know, we, we need to be able to treat them like human. That, that it, it, they tell us more about who we are than they can ever possibly tell us about who the gods are or yeah. what God wants. And I think if we approach them like that, then actually more of us will understand those texts and maybe we could end up having a conversation one day with ISIS leaders. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all of the nice. But, you know, it, it's... It, the Christian, the extreme Christians are probably more of a problem than the, for us than in, well, in our society than anyone uh, the ISIS are ever going to be, aren't they? Oh, my God, definitely. Yeah. When you, I mean, you look at it in terms of terrorism... Obviously, in the Western world, there's there's much more e- extremist, right-wing Christian stuff going on than there is yeah. anything else. Even in Devon, there's you know it's it's the animal rights activists who yeah. I quite proudly support, who who are the more the terrorist ones, like yeah. in a place. Hey, like this. come on, the bloke tried to take out a giraffe. If he just yeah. wait, if he'd waited ten years, it would just gone bust anyway. <laughs> um. <laughs> And how do you, I mean, I've seen you talk about this a little bit, but as a woman working in academia, and, mm. and, and, and when, I read, when I watched your YouTube, um, your, your show on YouTube, I made the mistake of looking at the comments. Uh, I never do that. Yeah, well, it's not, it wasn't me, so it doesn't matter. Uh, to me, I could look at it, yeah, but it's brilliant. Uh, no, but they, it's, is, it, is it difficult though, with that show, you know, the, it, you, is it more difficult to be taken seriously as a, as a woman on TV and as an academic? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And even if it wasn't TV, it's still harder to be taken seriously as a woman in academia just because no matter how, you know, we, we read in the press all the time that our universities are stuffed full of like liberal lefty um, academics who are all very, and, you know, there are a lot of nice, people that I work with in academia, but there are also a load of dinosaurs that, that do think that I'm, A, not clever, but because I'm a woman and atheist, and B, that I'm not particularly, you know, I've, I've only got to become a professor or got to my position because I slept with somebody or I got a nice smile or whatever. Yeah. So you get that shit all the time. And at conferences as well, people constantly, I had one guy at a conference, a massive conference in America, tell me I was the Kim Kardashian of <laughs> biblical studies. <laughs> and he thought it was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think, um, is the sexism, uh, is it, it, because it's, it's, as an atheist, that's kind of weird, right? But the, yeah. the, you're, the, the lot of people who, do, do, who study biblical studies are coming from a religious point of view. Mm. And so it's sort of weird that they would do that to me is the weird thing that you could come in with a, a prejudice in a, in a sense that you're studying something. And even in even that show about Paul, you can see the people who are desperately trying to make yeah. the facts fit into the religion rather than looking at it as, a, as an academic yeah. exercise. So is being an atheist within biblical studies a, a, a handicap as well or is, is that... I mean, for, in, intellectually, I don't think it's a handicap at all. Obviously, no. I think that it's a great thing. But, but yeah, in terms of my profession and my career, it is really difficult um, because most most academics and senior academics are religious in one way but a lot a lot of people are very supportive of what I do and and some academics who are religious do this thing where they kind of separate out their confessional life from their professional life or at least they think that's what they're doing right but like it it never really turns out that way so you you end up you you read these texts the biblical texts or whatever with an inevitable bias but I, I think being an atheist 
I don't know, I, someone called me double trouble because I was a woman and an atheist. <laughs> right. It was like, seriously? Like, seriously? <laughs> um, so I, I do think it's a bit harder. Yeah. Um, and Anne Widdicombe doesn't particularly care and for she you. she hates me. Yeah. yeah. So you've... Because yeah. you go on these Nicky Campbell d- yeah. discussion shows every now and again and you yeah. come and, and Anne Widdicombe... I mean, it's, that, it's sort of interesting when someone is that that they won't even countenance the idea of someone questioning no, anything. Exactly. So I suppose that is what faith is, but, you know, it's, it sort of seems weird to me that you would believe something and then not want to just check the facts of it or just, yeah, or and, just and run in, it by yourself yeah. every now and again. And in a way, the, the, biblical, the biblical writers almost kind of model that much better approach, like both in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. The fact you've got four different Gospels telling the same story but completely differently yeah. suggests that those biblical compilers and writers were much more comfortable with contradiction than yeah. we are as readers today. And you get exactly the same thing happening in the Hebrew Bible as well. Like the book of Job is all about, the whole point is to question God. Like seriously, you, you're completely screwing me over. And, and, and the idea that you explore that and you test it and you challenge it. But someone like Anne Widdicombe, she, she really struggled with that. Should I tell you my favourite Anne Widdicombe story yes, when I did do. that TV thing with her? Yeah. So we filmed this TV thing and she was interviewing me and I basically said Moses didn't exist and, or, and the exodus didn't happen and she called me a militant atheist, which was hilarious because like, I kind of think of militants as like having bombs strapped to them and stuff like yeah. that. And I was in a pair of very nice heels. Um, <laughs> and then afterwards, we were waiting after we'd done the filming. There were these two posh cars waiting to take Anne back off to whatever parliamentary do she had to go to, and me back to Paddington Station. So I get in my car, and the driver says, oh, here, yeah. he says, because uh, he could see Anne Woodcombe getting in the car in front. He said, yeah, she, uh, she's off the telly, isn't she? And I said, oh, yeah, she, she's, you know, that politician. And he went... Yeah, that's that Mo Mola minute. <laughs> so I just said, yeah. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, I met my, I met Mo Molum at uh, Jules Holland's Hootenanny. I sat on the oh. same table as her uh, in the pretend Hootenanny when it's actually it's November, and yeah, <laughs> you're pretending, you're pretending it's not. And then I watched myself on New Year's Eve, and I was on my own. On your own. Watching myself having a good time while I cried. <laughs> so, um, well, we're, we're coming to the end. I'll just get a couple of more. I'm not going to ask you any emergency questions any more than the God suck his own cock one, which is awful. Sorry. Which I didn't answer. You didn't. I reckon, I mean, the question is, he must have thought about doing it. Could, he could do it, couldn't he? He definitely could do it because he could just magic it so he could do it. And if he could do it, he's, he's done it. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my belief. <laughs> isn't one of the gods just the snakes eating its own tail anyway? That's something, isn't it? It's, it's basically, that's what God I is. Think that's like the never-ending story, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> 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 um, Adam and Eve always confuse me. Let's start at the beginning, and then we'll work through. Genesis. Right. Yeah. Um, where did because Cain and Abel, and well, then one of them kills the other one. Yeah, Cain kills Abel. And where? How do they produce more children anyway? Yeah. After after Adam and Eve have some kids. Well, one theory is um, that it's God that that fathers the first child anyway with Eve. It's Sweet. not Adam. And then the Cain has sex with Eve. That's one theory. Okay. Not nice, is it? No. <laughs> A lot of stuff like that on Pornhub at the moment. I don't, it's not. <laughs> I don't like it, but I can make it work, but I have to, I have to, <laughs> I just have to imagine them as actors, pretending. <laughs> um, but there's a, there's a whole other, there's another, there's an, Adam has another wife and stuff like this. In, in, well, in other, that's in later prof- Jewish tradition says that originally yeah. Eve wasn't Adam's first wife. Right. The first wife was Lilith who, and this is again, one of my favourite early, so this is a rabbinic story, so early, so about time of Jesus. Um, so the idea is that God makes Adam... So first, God makes all the animals yeah. for Adam to have a partner. And Adam's like, no, I don't have sex with that. No, I don't have sex with that. <laughs> and he says, okay, well, I'll make you a woman. And I was like, okay. So the first woman is actually Lilith, who her and Adam break up because she wants to be on top during sex. Right. And he says, no, I'm the man. I need to be on top. And she basically says, screw you. She says, if you're not going to let me go on top like, at least half the time, then I'm going to end this relationship. And so she flies off over the wall and then becomes a baby killer. <laughs> and then, this is just this Jewish myth, and then, and then, um, then so God makes Eve out of Adam's rib. own rib yeah. or side or 
body. One one scholar claims that it's his penis bone that is okay. that is Eve's kind of spine. Sweet. Because apparently <laughs> monkeys have them. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but does if they hadn't eaten the apple? It wasn't an apple. Okay. It just says fruit. They hadn't eaten the fruit. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think of it as an apple. Um, then what would have happened? They'd just all have been. They'd have just. No one would have had sex except for. No, their... they probably were having sex in the garden because the Hebrew, when you read it, it does kind of imply that they were already having sex in the garden okay. anyway. So they would have had sex and had babies, but everyone would have lived in God's garden and been oh, gardeners. That would have been much better. Yeah, it's like kind of Q Garden. <laughs> kind is. of like a kind of yeah. But you, as I saw in what, something you were saying that he, you think Eden is the church. The, in temple, Jerusalem, in yeah, temple in yeah. I think as it's drawn on that image. So the idea is that the temple is a meeting place between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. The temple's built on the top of a mountain because they always are. And basically it's about cultivated fertility and the, and the temple was full of all these kind of sacred trees and herbs and medicines that you could grow and, and kind of offer up to the gods. And so that seems to be what the temple story in, what the creation story in Genesis is riffing off. Okay. And Noah's Ark. Yeah. Is there anything in any of the other texts about how um, Noah managed to get all the animals together and sex them and go to Africa and find stuff that didn't exist already? Or is it just... I think... Because I feel like if I was writing that story, I'd put in a bit more detail about... That's yeah. the That's the interesting bit. If you're writing the film, and then I found some giraffes, and then I found... <laughs> yeah. And some elephants. I think I think because it's kind of when you read the Noah story in Genesis, it's only like three chapters, but then there's two different versions of the story, and in one version it's just like a pair of each animals, and then in the other version it's like seven pairs of kosher animals and two pairs of unkosher animals. Okay. So it's almost like someone has put in the thought about yeah. we need a bit more detail, but they've not kind of done the zoological detail that we might expect more the kind of culinary. Is no? Did Noah exist? No. Oh, come on, he must No, have. it's based, but it is based on a much older myth. Okay. So, a much older Sumerian myth. Okay. So, um, no, he still didn't exist, but it's a very old story. Okay. I like the Sumerian gods. That's Enki is one of the Sumerian Enki's gods. Enki's a dude. He masturbates into make rivers. Yeah, he basically lies on his back in, a, in the marshlands in Iraq the whole time with a massive erection and just waits for passing goddesses to come by. <laughs> <laughs> But then, it, then it actually it turns a bit horrible because he ends up raping a series of his own daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters. That is a bit horrible, yeah. Yeah, so it, does, it, does, it takes God. a dark turn. It's there, yeah. it's gone into Pornhub again. <laughs> 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 um, well, look, it's been fascinating to talk to you. The people of Exeter are stunned <laughs> by what they've had. It's Sunday, we've got to talk about religion. <laughs> if it's wrong to talk about God sucking his own cock on Sunday, I want to know. I don't want to be right. Um... <laughs> So this is coming out in 2020, so your book will be out this year? Yeah. In Waterstones? Yeah. And is it called? It's called, it's called God, God and Anatomy. Right. And there's a lot of pictures as well as words. Wow. And cock. Good. <laughs> <laughs> just random ones or just to do with the no, subject? No, mainly divine. Yeah, mainly okay. divine, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a massive round of applause for Professor Francesca Stavrakopoulou. Thank you. Come back next week. You come in for free. See you after break. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>